Today I'm going to ask you to leave your Bible open to our passage that we're studying in uh, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to take a few weeks and look at chapter 13. <clears throat> and I would begin by just asking a simple question. That question is, is God's Word enough? God's Word enough for us? I am working on in the book of Ephesians, it's only six chapters, it's not a, it's a, one of the smaller books in the Bible, memorizing um, the book of Ephesians, and I've got about three chapters done, and my plan is to, when I get that done, uh, just give that as a sermon. Not so you'll say, oh, that's wonderful, look how great he is, he can memorize that because I'll probably forget it three days after I memorize it, that's the way my mind works anymore. Uh, but really, because I believe God's word is enough, and I believe when we read God's word that it is powerful, um, and I believe it's important in our life, and that's what Jesus believed because he talks about it in our passage today. And so Matthew chapter 13, we're going to be looking at all of these verses, verses 1 through 23. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into the message today. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you that you have given us this opportunity to be able to proclaim your word, to read your word, to share your word, and expound upon. Lord, I would pray today that you would just help each and every one of us that are here today, uh, that you would speak to us, that you would help us as we go through this passage and study this passage, Lord, that it would penetrate our heart that we would be convicted about things in our life that are not pleasing to you. And Lord, that uh, we would take this message seriously today. I realize, God, that the challenge that we face as believers is that we get in a routine of coming here and doing the things that we do, and it becomes nothing more than routine. And so today I pray that your word would just reach our hearts. You would help us. Forgive me of the sin that is in my life and place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Help us today as we send forth this word, again, that it would be received. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we get to chapter 13, we're at a very pivotal time in the ministry of Jesus. And I want you to notice something specifically here, starting in chapter 13. Jesus taught in what is called parables. Now, you've heard that before. I'm sure you've heard of parables before. Maybe you don't know, understand exactly uh, what that means. But we're going to cover some of them because, in fact, in chapter 13 of Matthew, Jesus speaks seven different parables. And so we're going to look at these parables, not all of them today, but we're going to answer a couple questions. In fact, some of you may be wondering today, well, really, what is a parable? There are some cliches in the way that you could answer that question, what is a parable? And some of you uh, probably have your own way that you would answer that question. But I want us to think about that. And over the next few weeks, I want us to grasp this. What is a parable? What's the purpose of a parable? Why did Jesus so often when he was teaching not just say what he wanted to say? Why did he use these parables? Certainly you must have read the New Testament and you come across these parables and you think, I don't understand why Jesus chose this method of, of teaching. In fact, I think you would be frustrated to me if I preached in a parable. I think you would leave here saying, I don't understand a thing in the world that he's saying. Well, I hope that that wouldn't be the case. But simply put, and I want you to take note of this because it's important for all seven of these parables that we share. A parable is a story that has a spiritual truth, a spiritual point. In fact, it's a story that illustrates in that parable a spiritual truth. So it's not as though Jesus is just saying it's black and white. This is the way that it is. He gives a story, something that they can relate to in their day. And in that story, he gives a spiritual truth. So really, I think the best way for us to think about parables would be this. It's a story with a meaning beyond the surface level meaning. That means sometimes we have to dig a little bit. We have to pay attention. We have to listen maybe in ways that we would not have listened before. And as we get to the text today, that's exactly what we see happening. Jesus teaches, and that's what he's doing. He's teaching. He teaches using a parable. And he gives an everyday common thing that people would have understood. And that is a farmer that is sowing seeds. 
Now, immediately the question may come up when you read this, well, is Jesus trying to teach people how to farm? No, that's, that's not what he's doing at all. Rather, Jesus is teaching spiritual truth. He's just using something natural, something that they're familiar with every day. But it still brings me back to that question, but why? Why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, the answer to that question might sound surprising at first, but let's listen to it. Go down to verse 10, and this is really where I want to get started in this passage, and it says this, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it says in verse 10, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, why do you speak in parables? The same question I'm asking you today. In other words, Jesus, just tell us what you want us to know. Tell those listening what you want them to know. Why do you speak in parables? And then in verse 11, Jesus responds to them. Now take note of this, and I want you to underline verse 11. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but it has not been given to them. So do you notice there's two people here, the you's and the them's? The you's are the believers in Christ. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, they've been given to you. In other words, you understand them. But these other individuals, they do not understand them. Verse 12, whosoever has will be given more. Whosoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Whosoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And then verse 13, this is why I speak in parables, he says. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Now, verse 13 is an important verse to remember as well, and I would underline that also. Because it's easy for us to misunderstand and misrepresent what Jesus is actually saying here, what he's actually teaching in this passage. What is Jesus not saying? Take note of this. He is not saying, I speak in parables so that some people will not be able to understand what I say. And that's the common thought that many people have. Jesus didn't want them to know what he was saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying I'm speaking in these parables because uh, I do not want them to be able to understand what I'm saying. That had nothing to do with it at all. Rather, Jesus looks at them and he says, I speak in parables because some people will not understand any other kind of teaching. Now, this is remarkable because Jesus knew to hone them in, to get them in on this conversation, he had to do something extraordinary, something different. That's how I feel sometimes. That's how every preacher feels sometimes. You preach a message over and over again. You preach Sunday after Sunday, and you think, do they get it? Sometimes I wonder if I should do cartwheels or stand on my head or uh, jump over the pews, if maybe that would help you understand what I'm teaching a little better. Well, I don't think that that would. It may be entertaining, but it would not help you comprehend anything any better. But in other words, there are some people who hear the truth, but they don't really hear it. Now, did you get what I just said? They hear the word of God, but they don't really hear it. And so Jesus says maybe a parable will draw them in and it will open up their mind and open up their heart and it will just kind of draw them in to the conversation. Now, some have a problem with that because they say, well, doesn't that mean that Jesus is hiding the truth from certain individuals. No, Jesus didn't come to reveal truth. Jesus made it very plain that I came to reveal truth. Jesus said, I came to set, come to set people free with the truth. And so think of it this way. A parable gives us insight into that truth that Jesus is sharing. It's a spiritual message. It's delivered in a different kind of way using practical things, but it's still giving truth give people an opportunity to understand. Now there is something about comparing the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed or um, as Jesus would say comparing God's word to a farmer that's out there sowing seeds that tends I guess to make it easier to understand and easier to apply to their life and so many times is that not what pastors do when they teach? They teach you, they, they read what the Bible says, and then they give you kind of a practical way of applying that to your life. Well, that's exactly what the parables do. Jesus is very practical in the way that he teaches these things. 
So, Jesus says that those who are spiritually sensitive, they're going to get it. So those of you here today, as I share God's word week after week and even today, and you're spiritually sensitive, you're going to get it. And you're going to grow in your Christian faith. But if you're not seeking and you don't have that desire, and maybe you have to be even entertained. And let me just say to you, there are, are many types of religious gatherings where people will entertain you. If you want to be entertained, they will certainly entertain you. But that entertainment doesn't cause you to grow in your faith. So what I'm trying to say to you today is this. I'm not going to do cartwheels. I'm not going to bust my spleen. I'm going to teach the word of God, and I'm going to try to give it to you in a practical way that you are seeking it, that you want to understand it, that you want to learn, and that you apply it to your life. So I'll make the commitment to you to teach the word of God, but you need to make the commitment to me that you're willing to receive it, and you're willing to learn it. Now, that's the first question you have to ask yourself. Do I want to learn the word of God? And not everybody, perhaps, that's sitting here today would answer yes to that question. Well, let's get into this text this morning and look at this very first parable because I want to teach it. And I want you to get something from it and I want you to learn from it. Verse 3, again, paraphrasing here, says, There's a farmer that went out and he sowed his seed. And as he scattered the seed, some fell among the path and the birds came and they ate them up. Verse 5, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. We get to verse 6. But when the sun, sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, and they grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And then Jesus says in verse 9, after he gives that illustration, listen to this. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, do you have ears this morning? You would say, well, yes. What Jesus is actually asking here, do you have spiritual ears? Do you really want to hear and listen and learn from what Jesus is about to teach us? Well, that's what we're going to do. And this parable is an easy parable to interpret because Jesus spells it out to us in detail. And in his explanation, there are some things that we see. We see how we should take the word of God and use it in our everyday life. That's what this parable is about. You should write at chapter 13, beginning with verse number one, this is about the word of God. And if you ever have questions about the word of God, you read this parable because that's what Jesus is talking about. He's teaching us today what God's word can do for us as believers, and as Christians. Now, you may think you already know this, but let's get into it. And I want to give you four things today as we think about this, talking about the word of God. Here's the first one. Write this down. If you seek to understand the word of God, it can change your heart. Now, do you believe that? That if you truly are seeking to know God's word, and to understand God's word and to learn God's word, the only effect that it can have in your life is that your heart is changed. You cannot read God's word and study it and apply it and not have your life changed. Well, look at verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom, of, the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown among the path. So he gives this illustration here of all these different types of seeds. And now he says, this is that type of seed. Maybe this is that type of individual is how you should think about it. In fact, think about this. What has taken place with that individual that Jesus just spoke of? They heard the Bible taught, but they did not understand it. Now, there is no shame in that, but all of you have certainly heard people say, well, the reason I don't like going to church is I don't understand what they're saying. And the question you should ask is, why? Because that's a lot of people in our world and in our society and even people that come to our church. They hear the preaching, but they don't understand what we're talking about. So what would you generally say to somebody like that? Well, why don't you understand? Generally, we just say, oh, well, you're not a believer. That's why you don't understand. Or we make other assumptions why they cannot understand. 
But I want to shatter all that today, and I want to, to, to explain something about the Word of God. Understanding the Bible is not like trying to understand quantum physics. Okay, That's not what it's like, although some would say it seems like that. Trying to understand the Bible is not some complex theory that you have to understand, although people are intimidated to study the Bible. Why? Because they say things like, I just don't understand it. But listen, the ability to understand the Word of God is not a function of intellect. You do not have to be intellectually smart to understand the Word of God. And some people feel like, I'm just not smart enough to understand the Bible. It's not about intellect, it's about the will. Do you want to understand the Bible? It's about the choice that you make. Do you want to be spiritually perceptive? Now, let me, let me just throw this disclaimer out there. Apart from the Holy Spirit of God, you will never understand Scripture. Can we just agree on that? Never will you understand Scripture apart from the Holy Spirit of God. However, as a believer, you can be a believer, you can have the Holy Spirit living within you and still not understand the Holy Spirit of God. Why do, or still not understand Scripture, why do Christians live their entire life and not know what the Bible says? Because they're intimidated by it. And they don't know it. And they say, well, I just don't understand it. But if you want to be spiritually perceptive, you can be. If you want to understand what God says in his word, you can understand it. You have to realize it's a matter of choice. You have to choose. You have to make a decision. I want to know what God says. I want to study God's word. I want to learn. That's the reason you can have two people sit in a church pew all their life. And this happens all the time. I've seen this happen hundreds of times. You have the same two people that hear the same sermons. They hear the same reading from Scripture. They go to Sunday school week after week, and one of them has their life radically transformed, and they look like a spiritual giant, and the other one, they are not conformed unto the image of Christ, and it seems as though God's Word has not changed them at all. How does that happen? Why does that happen? Which one are you? That is the real question today. You see, if you choose not to understand the Bible, this is what happens. If you make a decision to say it's too hard, I'm not going to put in the time, I'm not going to put in the work, I don't want to understand, I'll let somebody else explain it to me, that's why we pay you, Pastor. We come here every week and you just explain it to us. That's not good enough. Notice what Jesus said in verse 19. This is where all of this comes back to. He says, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. In other words, it never takes root. Why are there spiritually immature Christians? Because they sit in church, they do all the religious things, but God's word has never taken root in their life. But if you do choose to understand, then it does take root in your heart and you're changed. You're made new. The Apostle Paul said old things become new. Well, some will take that verse and they'll say, that person's not a Christian because there wasn't a transformation. I don't see that in their life. Well, they may be a Christian. It may just not have taken root. Now, we all know people like that. Some of you are people like that. And it's frustrating to come to church time and time again and listen to preaching time and time again and then not understand what God's Word teaches us. But God's Word is powerful. And can we agree that God's Word is enough? There's a story about John Wesley. He was an 18th century preacher who rode on horseback and he preached all through England and the United States. And one night he was riding along and this man stopped him and the man said to him, he said, give me everything that you have. And so Wesley took out what money he had in his pocket and he gave it to this man and man put his gun down and started to ride away and Wesley stopped him and he said my friend you may regret this sort of life and if you ever do he said I want you to remember this message that the blood of Jesus can cleanse you of all of your sin so the guy that robbed him 
ran away into the night, and John Wesley continued on in his journey. Some years later, he was preaching a revival on a Sunday evening, and this man walks forward, and he says, I want to talk to you. And he said, I was the man that robbed you that night. Now, he said, I want to say to you that those words that you gave me, he said, they radically changed my life. And he said to that man, Wesley said to that man, it wasn't me, but it was the precious power in the blood of Jesus Christ through his word that radically changed your life. Now, when I hear that, I think, how could something so simple change someone's life? Well, I think we forget that's the power in the word of God. We don't just claim that it is powerful. We don't just want to believe that it is powerful. It is <clears throat> powerful. So the choice that you make today to understand God's word is a choice on whether or not your heart will experience true change. You say, well, I am a Christian. I just don't understand. See, there's a difference between being a spiritual Christian and a non-spiritual Christian. Jesus teaches us in this parable, if you seek to understand the word of God, it will change your heart. My question to you today is, has your heart truly, really been changed? There's a second principle that we see in this passage, and I want you to write this down. Again, we're talking about God's word and what it does in our life. Number one, if you seek to understand it, it will change your heart. But number two, if you let it take root, that is the word of God in your life, you'll find the wisdom and the strength to handle problems in your life. Verse 20, Jesus said, the seed fell on rocky ground. And what does that refer to? It refers to somebody who hears the word and at once they receive it with joy. You know what happens? That sun comes up and then it dries up, right? Well, here's an interesting thing. You have to ask yourself, what does this picture? I think back over my, not just my Christian life, <clears throat> but my ministry. I have had the opportunity to perform, uh, or to say miracles, uh, to perform um, funeral services for believers and for non-believers. And I believe there is a difference in the way true spiritually mature Christians uh, see death versus those that are not truly spiritually mature. I believe there's a difference whenever problems come, whenever marital problems come, whenever financial problems come. When any problem in life comes, I truly believe those that are grounded upon the word look at things differently than those that are not grounded upon the word. And what is the difference? Those that are grounded, those that know God's word, don't just use the word faith as a hopeless meaning. They don't just say, oh, God is trying to teach me something. They feel it. They know that God is real. They know that God's presence is with them. Now, the thing we have to remember is that the more you hear the word of God, the more you know the word of God, the more God's word takes root in your life. I could not express this to you enough today, church. Hearing the Bible one time a week, I'm glad that you do. But if this is all that you get, when those problems and those trials come into your life, you're going to be just like this parable that we just read about. And you're going to wither away. You're not going to be rooted. You're not going to be grounded. Turn very quickly to 1 Peter. I want you to see this because in 1 Peter chapter 4, at least write this verse down, he says, my friends, he's pleading with other Christians, don't be surprised when those fiery trials that you go through, that some people, he says, will just give up. And that other people, he says, will remain strong. The point is you have to let God's word get rooted in your life and you have to answer that question before you leave here today. Because one day you will stand before God and give an account for how rooted God's word is in your life. You say, well, how does it take root? I mean, I think all of you would sign up for that today. I want God's word to take root. How does it take root in my life? Through repetition, through reading it, through listening to it, through meditating on it. Through memorizing it, and I'm telling you, the older I get, that becomes more and more difficult. By learning it, 
it's going to help you deal with those problems when they come in your life. And so Jesus teaches us the second principle. If you let it take root in your life, the word of God, you'll find the wisdom and strength to handle the problems when they come. And I am a living testament to say that I have seen this work both ways. Those that are spiritually mature, grounded in God's word, and those that are not. It doesn't mean that everything's easy. It's just their outlook on life is different. Now, there's a third principle about the word of God that I want you to take note of in this parable. Number three, if you keep it as a priority in your life, it will help you keep your other priorities straight. And now, a nice way of saying, that's a nice way of saying God's word will keep you on the right path. God's word will convict you when you're wrong. God's word will convict you when you're doing things that are wrong. Look what he says in verse 22. The seed falling among the thorn, what does that refer to? Some who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of life choke it out. They choke that word out and they make it unfruitful. I want you to think about this for just a moment. There are people that hear God's word. There are people that accept God's word. But over a period of time, those individuals allow other things to choke out God's word in their life. There's a very interesting statistic that I read this week, according to Barna Research Group. And I don't know how true this is, but I just have to believe that it probably is somewhat accurate. It said that only four out of 10 people who claim to be Christians also claim that they are absolutely committed to the Christian faith. So four out of 10 Christians that would say, I am a spiritual Christian. I am someone that not only believes in Christianity, but I practice it in my life. I know what the Bible says. You know why so many people are, are um, afraid to have debates with those that are non-believers, and by the way, sometimes that can be a waste of time, but I'm just saying in general, it's because Christians don't know what the Bible says. They're afraid to defend something that they know nothing about. I remember a professor giving a very good illustration of this many, many years ago. He came to the front of the room, and he had learned this at some seminar, I guess, and he took this big one-gallon uh, wide mouth jar, and he set it on the table. And he filled that jar up with these big rocks. And he asked the question, he said, is that jar full? Well, people said, yeah. He said, no, it's not full. So then he had some little gravel and he put that little gravel there in the jar. And then he said, is this jar full? Well, he wasn't fooling us then. We caught on and we said, no, we knew where this was going. So then he poured some sand in there and he said, is this jar full? And we said, no. And finally, he filled it up with water, and he said, is this jar full? And we said, yes. Now, what's the point? The point that he was making is that there are gaps. And if you're really willing to work at it, you can always fill in more in your life. But the real point was this. The real point is you should not have, have put in, uh, the big rocks in first, because you should have put the big rocks in first because if you didn't put the big rocks in first, you would have never gotten the big rocks in once you put all the other stuff in. Now, the parallel to that is, and I want you to think of this in a spiritual sense, what is the big rock, the big rocks in our life as a Christian that we need to fill our life with? It's not all those little things that we do in the Christian life that come later. The biggest rock that we can put in our life as a Christian is knowing and studying God's word. Having a love for God's word. Church, do you know why I challenge you every year to read through the Bible in any manner that you can in a year? It's not so I can just say, hey, all of our people read the Bible through in a year. We must be super spiritual. No, because I know as a Christian that is the power behind your life. That is the power behind your Christian faith. One final point that we see in this passage, number four. If you live according to God's word, your life will become one big harvest. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He says, if you live 
with my word being full in your life, there's only one outcome, and that is that your life's going to be full of harvest. Does that mean you get everything that you want? No, you're misunderstanding. But he does say this in verse 23, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word of God and they understand it. Remember, they want to understand it. They're trying to understand it. They're working at understanding it. He said, this is the one that produces a crop, yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. It's always amazing to me how in this Christian life, you would think that we would have so many Christians that we could look at and say they are spiritual giants. But I challenge you to do that. How many people do you know as Christians that are faithful to the word of God, that know the word of God? that can help you with the word of God. I would say that list becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. But you see, you can know the word of God. You can take the challenge to understand the word of God. You can apply the word of God to your life. Here is my challenge to you this week. Read this parable. Ask yourself, which one of these soils represent my life as a Christian? And if you're still breathing and you're still living and you're still smiling and you're still here today, I want to tell you something. There's time to change. There's time to apply God's word to your life. Think about this. The creator of the universe is willing to speak to you through his word. Are you willing to listen 